They say necessity is the mother of invention. Time and time again, the forces unleashed by modern warfare have been shown to be the catalyst for massive change. These changes are often achieved in very short timescales. Under peacetime conditions, normally a new fighting vehicle would be designed, built and tested over a period of something like five years. Between 1941 and 1945, some very successful designs were produced in as many months. They had to be. The war in the East was a demanding and remorseless taskmaster, which consumed every new offering as soon as it was ready for action. The price of failure was unthinkable. From 1943 onwards, German engineers were driven by the desperate demands of a voracious front line, which threatened to consume their very homeland if they did not supply exactly the right technology in the shortest possible timescales. Despite the vile excesses of the regime under which they toiled, German factories produced an outstanding variety of armored fighting vehicles in an incredibly short period of time. It has often been said that the German armaments industry placed the best possible weapons in the worst possible hands. That is certainly true of the armored fighting vehicles. Obviously, there were many failures, but against the odds, there were also a large number of successful vehicles which shaped the face of armored warfare for years to come. During uh, the Second World War, what happens with the German army is that they have a lot of vehicles that rapidly become obsolete, like the Panzer II, the Panzer III. And what they do is they take the chassis of those vehicles and they marry it up with a gun and turn them into assault weapons. And uh, they also take a lot of captured weapons that they have and turn them into mobile artillery, like the uh, Czechoslovakian T-35, that sort of thing. So it's an evolutionary type of thing that the German army does. Sturm artillery is nothing more than tracked artillery that was designed to keep up with the Panzers, to give them ready and quick transport. One successful new breed, born out of desperation by the demands of the Russian front, were the self-propelled artillery vehicles, which were rushed into production from the war-ravaged German factories to shore up the desperate defensive battles of that terrible conflict. A mobile artillery force, which could be rushed from place to place on the crumbling front, they were to supply the needs of a military situation which was declining on an almost daily basis. Only two short years earlier, no one in their right minds would have believed such a situation could prevail so soon. In the glory days of 1941, Adolf Hitler had appeared invincible. Hitler was a gambler. For nine years, he was also a highly successful gambler. He made the right calls in the cutthroat political world of the Weimar Republic and Nazi Germany. He gambled on the annexation of Austria and of Czechoslovakia. And he called the bluff of Britain and France over the Treaty of Versailles. And his inspired combination of guesswork and aggression precipitated the spectacular fall of France in 1940. But like all gamblers, eventually the lucky streak runs out. Hitler's luck ran out when he began to believe in his own invincibility and to ignore the lessons of history. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. By subscribing to History Hit, you can access hundreds of hours of military history documentaries on demand.
Follow in the footsteps of the Essex Dogs with Dan Jones will discover the history of archery with Ray Mears. We've built up an extensive library of history programs, hundreds of hours of documentaries, exclusive original films, interviews, and ad-free podcasts made for proper history fans. Sign up now for a free trial and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. In the 18th century, the invincible Swedish army of Charles the Bold had been destroyed in Russia. In the 19th century, Napoleon had seen his grand army wither and die at the infamous campaign of 1812. And even the all-conquering British army of the Victorian era had received one of its few reverses with an unsuccessful dismal campaign in the Crimea, marked by disease, hardship and despair. But spurred on by the great successes in the West during May 1940, Hitler drove his forces on into Russia. They were to come unstuck on almost exactly the same battlefields as Napoleon had before Moscow. And in 1944, the Crimea was to spell disaster for German troops, with losses on a scale which the British army could not have believed possible. In late 1941, Operation Typhoon ground to a halt on the very outskirts of the great city of Moscow, near the site of Napoleon's battlefield of Borodino. And in 1944, a whole German army was lost in the same Crimea, which the British had failed to take during its own campaign. The lessons of military history were there for all to see, but Hitler chose to ignore them. One of the reasons for his arrogance was his irrational belief in the power of particular new weapons to achieve decisive results where others had failed. This was a trait which was to take on a fantastical quality later in the war, but there was a tiny element of rationality in his thinking. He had certainly been proved right when the new panzer divisions had sliced through the Ardennes to capture France, and who could blame him for believing the same thing was possible in Russia? especially with weapons like the mighty Karl Supermorter at his disposal. In 1855, the British and French forces fighting in the Crimea had laid siege to Sevastopol. Ninety years later, the German forces fighting in the Crimea were to do exactly the same thing. The siege mortars fired in the 1854 campaign by the British troops were later echoed in the Mighty Karl series, monsters deployed by Hitler's forces in 1942. At the time of Hitler's siege of Sevastopol, six of these enormous self-propelled guns could be called up. This time, there would be no protracted siege or stalemate. The massive artillery support from the Karls helped shatter the Russian defences, and Sevastopol fell into German hands in 1942. These monster machines rolled around on fully tracked chassis, with 11 road wheels on each side, and their massive 54 centimetre guns fired a shell which weighed an astonishing 1,577 kilograms. Only six were ever built, but these six were enough to secure Sevastopol for Hitler, where the British had failed. Each of these massive guns were given a name. The first four were called after the Norse gods of mythology, Thor, Odin, Loki, Zui, and the last two, rather bizarrely, after the biblical figures, Adam and Eve. The Karl was a gigantic 60 centimetre mortar mounted on tracks, self-propelled mounting. It weighed 124 tonnes and really was completely out of court as far as a fighting vehicle is concerned and you'd have to consider it more or less a piece of fixed artillery that could just about move rather than self-propelled artillery in the conventional sense. What had happened was that in the First World War the Austrians had demolished some enormous Belgian fortresses by using horse-drawn and tractor-drawn artillery and mortars of a very heavy calibre. And the Germans were clearly 
trying to emulate this, and they started it in about 1937 by developing this massive mortar, building a tracked carriage for it, and then using it, I think only in Russia, against some of the fortresses at Sebastopol and this sort of thing. And there are cases during the assault on Sebastopol where it blew open some enormous concrete defences. But really, a thing like that is a very specialist weapon. It had to be taken to bits in order to be moved anywhere on special carriers, and was probably in more trouble than it was actually worth. In many respects, the summer campaign of 1942 was the high watermark for the Wehrmacht. After the siege of Sevastopol, there was little work for the Karls to do, as it was now the turn of the German armies to come under siege. But the Karl class of self-propelled siege gun had proved itself successful in action. Unfortunately, the same could not always be said for Hitler's other innovations. The Karl represented the very large end of weapons development. These men are training with the other extreme, both in size and success. This was Goliath, one of three of the so-called demolition tanks made by Germany in the war. It was a miniature remote control tank, which was designed to be guided up to enemy tanks or pillboxes, then detonated. Although this footage shows troops training with these weapons, it is obvious, even from this, that the operators had to expose themselves to hostile enemy positions in order to have any prospect of guiding the suicide weapon onto its target. In consequence, casualties were very high, and this job was very unpopular among the troops operating machines such as the Borgvord B4 or the Goliath. Nonetheless, over 7,500 remote control demolition tanks were built and used by the troops in the field. Their success rate is not recorded, but the ratio of failures to successes was high. The Karl and the Goliath represented very much the unconventional end of the military spectrum. Now the Goliath here was another rather fancy idea. It's basically a tiny tracked vehicle packed with high explosive, which is directed onto its target by remote control. The Germans actually built a number of these things, either worked by radio, or in this case by wire, reeling out from the vehicle, like a little child's toy with a battery box at the back. And the men would guide it onto its target. Again, you could only really expect to use a thing like this against fixed defences. And it was the very nature of German warfare to keep mobile, so one wonders where they anticipated using it half the time. I've seen film of Goliath in which the thing is virtually incapable of staying the right way up on anything but dead level ground. And of course, the further away it is from the operator, the more difficult it is for him to aim. And once the opposition figure out what it is, they're going to do all in their power to stop it. It only requires a shot, cutting the wire to finish it. We developed similar things in Great Britain. They were all considered to be a completely useless effort. None of them ever worked properly. And I would say the same must be said for poor old Goliath. There is a, a famous photograph, I think taken in Italy, of a US Army soldier standing on a mountain of the darn things. And I can imagine the German army saying, to hell with it, these things are simply not worth bothering with. All the trouble of carrying to the site, setting them up, probably too wasted the minute the thing breaks down halfway to target. Today, the rusting hulks of the armoured fighting vehicles of the Wehrmacht lie still and silent under a summer sun. This is the U.S. Army Ordnance Museum Foundation in Maryland, USA. Final resting place for many of the survivors of the titanic struggle on the Russian front. The white winter camouflage contrasts incongruously with the green summer grass and blue skies. These machines, which once brought terror to the continent of Europe, now lie rusting silently away. Among the well-known tanks such as the Panther and the Tiger are a few less familiar names. The Hummel, the Vesp and the Grasshopper. But in their day when these drab white color schemes served a real purpose on the snow-covered steppes of Russia, their contribution was every bit as vital as the famous tanks in the spearhead. The use of tracked vehicles to support the objectives of the Wehrmacht had grown exponentially since the start of World War II in 1939. 
Even in 1941, only 19 of the 140 German divisions deployed for the invasion of Russia were panzer divisions. The army of 1942 was much more mobile. Panzer grenadiers moving swiftly around the battlefield in armored half-tracks were much more numerous. But even mobile infantry still required artillery support to achieve many of their objectives. That artillery support needed to be as mobile as they were. The Sturmgeschutz assault gun had originally been designed to provide the support. But by 1942, battlefield necessities meant that they were often hijacked into the role of tank destroyers. This deprived the troops of close artillery support, which the Geschutz were originally designed to provide. It left a gap which could not be filled by the medium or heavy artillery. These heavier guns often lagged behind the motorized troops across the huge distances which had to be covered in Russia. In Europe, during the campaigns of 1939, 40 and 41, where roads were good, it was found that conventional artillery could be moved and deployed reasonably easily. But in Russia, the dirt roads turned to rivers of mud with the arrival of spring and autumn rains, and they were frequently covered in deep snow during the winter months. The best possible solution for the provision of heavy artillery support for the mobile battles now being fought in Russia was the deployment of large caliber, self-propelled guns on fully tracked carriages. These vehicles could stick reasonably close to the fast-moving panzer divisions and provide them with the same heavy artillery support which would normally require horse-drawn or motorized transport. They were collectively known as Sturm artillery or self-propelled guns. These troops seen here during the German advance into the Caucasus in 1942 are towing their gun into action. But to get into action, the gun has to be first unlimbered. At this point, the crew will be exposed to enemy fire. The heavy 15 centimeter infantry gun could be mounted on a tracked chassis to produce a vehicle which was always ready for action and which gave the crew a measure of protection against artillery fire and which could keep pace with the spearheads over the worst possible terrain. The self-propelled artillery units had been born. The first self-propelled guns proved effective but as the war wore on and Germany's situation grew increasingly desperate, her hard-pressed armies found themselves facing superior firepower from increasingly heavy enemy artillery. To combat this, the Wehrmacht needed a variety of mobile gun platforms capable of moving heavy artillery to hard-pressed sections over the vast battlefields of Russia. Ultimately, Thousands of self-propelled guns in a bewildering variety of variations would see action. Although it was the insistent demands of the Russian front which provide the real catalyst for the development of self-propelled guns, there were a number of earlier precedents. Limited numbers of self-propelled guns called Schwer Infantry Geschutz, or SIG for short, had been successfully deployed in the 1940 campaign in France. Initially, these vehicles used the ridiculously light Panzer I chassis to carry the heavy 15-centimeter infantry gun. The troops advancing here are using the gun to blast infantry from buildings and strong points. And despite the obvious limitations of these first self-propelled guns, it was actions like these that convinced the high command that there was a role for fully mobile heavy artillery carried on a tracked chassis. 
The Panzer I was Germany's first and smallest tank. Secretly developed as an agricultural tractor during the years when Germany was prevented from developing tanks by the Treaty of Versailles, it was very much a starting point. It was a two-man machine, smaller than many modern saloon cars. It soon proved to be hopelessly inadequate under combat conditions. The armor was too thin, and the two machine gun armament was ineffective. But the chassis itself was a good one, and German engineers immediately set to work to produce specialist variants for other battlefield tasks. The Germans, as a race, have long been famous for the quality of their engineering work. They are also justifiably renowned for their meticulousness. A demonstration of this can be seen in the thorough manner in which every tank chassis manufactured during World War II was methodically exploited, with uniform thoroughness and regularity, to produce a wide array of specialist vehicles to cater for every need on the battlefield. Each of the tank chassis produced by German manufacturers or by her Czechoslovakian satellite suppliers was systematically altered to produce not just the main battle tanks themselves, but in almost every case there was also a tank destroyer variant and a self-propelled artillery variant. In most cases, there were also command tanks, armoured ammunition tanks, armoured recovery vehicles and even flame-throwing tanks. In the case of self-propelled artillery, this systematic approach to the design possibilities of each model was first seen in the Panzer I. As we have seen, it was the successful adaptation of the Panzer I chassis which allowed the SIG-33 to carry a heavy 15cm gun to give a heavy self-propelled artillery piece which could be moved right up to the front line. However, there was one major drawback in the arrangement of such a big gun on such a small chassis. It was so top-heavy that the gun was very liable to topple over. This undignified trait led to the search for a better alternative. Naturally, the first step was to examine the larger chassis of the other German light tank in service, the Panzer II. Like the Panzer I, the Panzer II battle tank was found to be woefully inadequate under combat conditions. And like the Panzer I, the outdated Panzer II chassis was successfully developed as a self-propelled gun carriage in an attempt to extend the life of the design. In this respect, the Panzer II worked only a little better than the Panzer I. Although it gave a slightly lower profile, and hence better stability and a greater measure of protection to the crew, it was only manufactured in tiny quantities. Only 12 were made, and all appear to have been dispatched to Africa to equip the Africa Corps. In practice, neither the Panzer I or the Panzer II chassis could really deal with the requirement of the heavy 15 centimeter gun, which they were being adapted to carry. The lateral solution to the problem was found by reducing the weight of the gun from 15 centimeters to 10.5 centimeters. This produced the VESP, or WASP, which combined the lighter 10.5 cm gun on a Panzer II chassis. The VESP was an excellent design, which was light enough to keep up with the troops, but heavy enough to produce an effective barrage. 682 of these machines were produced from 1942 and 1944. They were welcomed with open arms by the hard-pressed troops. One thing which did not find favor was the name. It did not suggest power and presence and was dropped on the personal orders of Hitler in 1944. However, they continued to be known as wasps to the troops who did value their considerable sting in battle. It was the most important of the German self-propelled armored artillery types. It was a very neat looking piece of equipment. And the strange thing is that although they utilized the chassis, by the time the German army used the chassis, it was obsolete. The unfortunate thing about this, there was not sufficient accommodation space in this vehicle. And this is, I think, as most soldiers will tell you, this is very important. You have to have places where you can put things. And this is one of the great drawbacks of this particular vehicle. It operated with the light batteries, you know, the smaller 
uh, batteries of uh, armoured artillery battalions of armoured artillery regiments. So these are quite versatile vehicles and they're quite important ones. But that's a good example, as I say, of a really of an obsolete piece of equipment being brought back into service and uh, yes, more or less performing the role. But with all obsolete vehicles, as I've said, there you've got crew complaint about lack of accommodation. So although you may get it rapidly into service, you have the disadvantage of, of its shortcomings. It has to be improved or adapted. With the introduction of the VESP, the possibilities for the Panzer II chassis appeared to have been exhausted. The ceaseless demands of the Russian front called for heavier and heavier guns. So German engineers moved on to examine the possibilities inherent in the Panzer III, which was Germany's main battle tank in the early years of the war. This proved to be a much more fertile hunting ground. The main variant produced using the Panzer III chassis was the famous Sturmgeschutz, the assault gun variant, which went on to become one of the most successful designs of the war. By dispensing with the turret to mount a long 75 centimeter gun, the resultant vehicle was efficient both in the role of assault gun and tank destroyer but the Sturmgeschutz was a compromise machine. It was not really designed as a specialist tank hunter, although it could do the job, nor was it capable of supplying a heavy artillery barrage. Both of these demands took the Sturmgeschutz away from its role supplying close artillery support to the troops in the front line. To supplement the assault guns, it was now obvious that the Wehrmacht needed both a dedicated purpose-designed tank killer and a separate vehicle, purpose designed for heavy artillery support and mounted on a mobile tracked chassis. The solution was to adapt the Panzer IV chassis to produce two specialist machines. In the tank hunter role came the Nashorn or Rhinoceros, produced from 1943 onwards. Its 8.8 centimeter gun was what was needed to deal with Russian tanks at longer ranges. There was a German uh, assault piece called Nashorn, the Rhino. I mean, this, this, was, this was an extraordinary beast, literally well-named, I must admit. Uh, it, uh, it had a short life. It had uh, a very limited function. I don't know, but looking at it, it must have been very difficult to handle. And above all, what you don't want to be on the battlefield is a target for other enemy projectiles. You have to think about that as well. The uh, German side developed very good, standard, stable designs, and the uh, German tank program continued to be extremely cost-effective. With a deadly punch, the Nashorn was clearly a major step in the right direction. Although its high profile and lack of crew protection did give severe grounds for reservation, but its main gun was sufficiently powerful and some 500 of these excellent tank destroyers were manufactured. The vehicle behind me is the, uh, the Nashorn, the, the Rhinoceros, and it's also the uh, chassis of the Panzer IV, but it has an 88 millimeter gun. And this is the anti-tank uh, hunting version of the vehicle. The vehicle was also used as the chassis for a, uh, a gun, uh, a regular art field artillery piece was also used uh, by the German army. These experiments yielded the Hummel, or Bumblebee. The Hummel used the Panzer IV chassis to carry a heavy 15 centimeter gun for mobile artillery bombardment. This vehicle overcame all the drawbacks of the previous self-propelled guns. It carried a much heavier punch, could be very rapidly deployed, and of course, it could be easily moved to avoid counter barrages by enemy guns. 666 machines eventually entered service. There was a huge demand for the frontline units and there were never enough to go round. Yeah, once again, I mean, this is a, an example of the Germans using their chassis. You know, they used the chassis of, you know, the Panzer, uh, the Panzers three and four, which is a very good idea. You've got a basically good chassis. Why, why not get on with it? 
and that uh, uh, what happened with the Hummel, which is the bumblebee, it proved to be, and I think most German soldiers will tell you this, was an, an extremely, uh, both a very powerful weapon and actually a very successful weapon. And it was actually brought into full service in 1943 and was used largely by tank battalions. But it's again this business, I think, of having a very particular capability on the battlefield. And, and really, the Hummel seems to have fitted very, very well into German panzer divisions. And if I think altogether the German army took delivery of over more than 600 of them, which is really quite good, and it really had a very good record indeed. It was a very useful piece of, uh, of field artillery to be used uh, in close proximity with, with the, um, the tank divisions as such. A very successful piece of equipment. The Hummel and the Vesp were to prove highly successful under battlefield conditions. Both could give mobile artillery support to the hard-pressed panzer divisions, then quickly move location before they could be targeted by the superior numbers of Allied artillery. In total, some 1,300 of these two types of self-propelled guns were made from 1942 to 1945, during which time they provided essential artillery support to the great advances of 1942 and covering fire for the desperate Wehrmacht divisions during their headlong retreat into Germany during 1944. The only major drawback of these self-propelled guns was the lack of storage space for stocks of ammunition. In the case of the Hummel, there was only enough room for 18 rounds. A constant round of resupplying was therefore required during any significant bombardments. However, by 1944, ammunition supplies were strictly limited in the German forces, and unlike the glory days of 1941, even these limited stocks had to be shepherded very carefully indeed. In line with the German factories, the tank-producing Skoda works in Czechoslovakia also produced self-propelled artillery, using the chassis from the Czech-manufactured tanks. The Czech-made Panzer 38T equipped many German units during the early years of the war, and when the tanks were withdrawn from frontline service, it made sense to convert the highly serviceable chassis into a self-propelled artillery roll. The resultant machine, which combined a 10.5 cm howitzer with the 38T chassis, was known to the Germans as the Grill, or Cricket. Never as popular as the Vesp or the Hummel, nevertheless, 282 machines were manufactured and they saw action mainly in Russia. A few were also used in the campaign in the West after the Allied landings. By this stage of the war, time was beginning to run against the Germans, and in the limited time available, the late war Panzer V and VI chassis did not produce as many conversions as previous vehicles but the Panzer IV produced one of the most successful designs. 
in the form of the Panzer Jager IV, a superb tank hunter. Unlike the Panzer I, II, and III, the Panzer IV remained in service throughout the war, so there was never likely to be a surplus of redundant vehicles for conversion. In any case, the successful introduction of the Vesp and Hummel solved the technical problems of mobile heavy artillery support. In consequence, further attempts to use the Panzer IV chassis for self-propelled artillery were limited to a few experiments which produced this machine, nicknamed the Grasshopper. This is the Grasshopper. It is undoubtedly one of the worst ideas ever. What it is, it's the chassis of the Panzerkampfwagen Mark IV, uh, but you see that it has this turret and a gun. But you notice that it has a superstructure on the back of the vehicle. The idea was this. You dig a hole. The engineers would come and line it with concrete. Then you would use the superstructure on the back to dismount the turret and put the turret in the hole. Now, th this makes no sense for a mobile weapon to be fixed into position. It's dumb. With regard to the grasshopper, what the Germans did, they took the chassis of the Panzer IV, which was a, a very good chassis, and which lasted, by the way, throughout the length of the war. And they exploited it this time in a very different manner. What they did, as you know, they, they, they had a system whereby the turret was removable. If you look at the side of the turret, you'll see the two uh, bolt holding positions where this vehicle, if you like, self-propelled artillery piece, it really was basically a, a weapons carrier. It was carrying a weapon. That was the idea. The weapon being the turret itself, which because of the capability of the tank, which had really it, it, its own lifting equipment, you removed the turret, could be removed from the tank, you could do one of two things with that. You could either apply uh, two wheels to the turret which you had removed and move it to whichever position you wanted, or in fact you could then emplace it as a fixed firing point, uh, as a, if you like, an immediately emplaceable uh, strong point. This is a very rare machine indeed, of which only a very few were produced. Some sources put the figure as low as two machines, others say 14 were made. With the warped logic which led to its creation, that's no great surprise. In order to allow for the turret to give the protection the crew needed, the gun size had to be reduced to 10.5 centimeters, when what was actually demanded were heavier caliber guns. By 1944, the Allied air forces in the West enjoyed almost total air superiority. In Russia, the air force had recovered from its early defeats and was now almost as effective as the British and Americans. Vehicle losses reached catastrophic proportions as the fighter bombers rolled over the front looking for targets. Now the real priority was for anti-aircraft protection, which could move with the tanks and give some cover against the relentless attacks of the Allied fighter bombers. It was in this role that more Panzer IV conversions were made. These self-propelled anti-aircraft guns were produced in three forms. Firstly, there was the mobile wagon which the troops nicknamed the furniture van because of its resemblance to a peacetime removals truck. It was followed by two later machines, the Verbalwind or Whirlwind and Ostwind or Eastwind. In the case of the Mobilwagen, this was very much a wartime contingency measure rather than a purpose-designed vehicle. As damaged Panzer IVs were brought back for repair from the Eastern Front 
they were converted to an anti-aircraft role by the simple expedient of taking off the turret and replacing it with a 20mm flank gun, which was protected, when in transit, by four collapsible sides which were lowered when the flank gun was in action. To say this was an unsuccessful design is an understatement. The 20mm gun was soon found to be woefully inadequate for the job of anti-aircraft defense. Of even greater concern was the fact that the sides of the mobile bargain had to be lowered to allow the gun to fire. This left the crew with no protection whatsoever and defeated the whole purpose of mounting the gun on a tank chassis in the first place. The frontline troops were quick to point out that, in action, the same result could have been achieved by placing an anti-aircraft gun on the back of a truck. Miraculously, 240 conversions had been made before this glaring design flaw came to light. Effectively, 240 precious tanks had been wasted. A measure of effectiveness was achieved by increasing the size of gun from 20 mm to 37 mm. But the mobile wagon was deemed a failure. It was obvious that what was required was an anti-aircraft vehicle that gave the crew the benefits of armor protection while they were in action. The solution was a specialist vehicle known as the Verbalwind. It used the Panzer IV chassis and used four 20mm flank guns in a quad arrangement, now mounted on a fully rotating turret, which gave the crew some measure of protection. The Verbalwind was nothing more than uh, anti-aircraft artillery. It had four 20mm cannon on it. And because the Allies had uh, air superiority, uh, the Germans had to have a way to keep mobile anti-aircraft artillery up with their tanks uh, to protect not only their tanks, but things like their trains, the, the logistics trains that any army has. And this was a very, very effective way to do it because we had four very fast-firing cannon uh, that were used in anti-aircraft mode and could take out um, low-flying uh, Allied aircraft, like the Typhoon, which was a rocket-firing aircraft used uh, against tanks. Uh, very difficult to take out German tanks using our equipment on the ground, the American M4 Sherman being a perfectly awful tank. But uh, a rocket-firing Typhoon could certainly take out a Tiger, no problem. So the whirlwind, the, the whirlwind, was a way to keep the Allied aircraft off your tank. Even mounted in groups of four, the 20mm gun was still ineffectual, so the verbal VIN was discontinued after 100 had been built. The successor to the verbal VIN was known as the Ostwind, but the end was now in sight and only 43 machines were made to combat an Allied Air Force which was flying 20,000 aircraft in the skies over Germany. Despite the revolutionary quality of many of the machines produced for Hitler's armies, they could never hope to match the sheer weight of numbers ranged against them. Given the depraved nature of the regime which brought them into existence, every civilized person should give thanks for that.